Welcome to Coffee and Crime, the true crime podcast where I drink some coffee and talk about true crime stories. For the next two weeks, I'll be covering the case that got me into true crime, Jack the Ripper. Jack the Ripper is one of the most well-known true crime stories in history. He's notorious for many reasons, but mostly due to the mystery surrounding him since he was never caught. There's plenty of speculation as to who he was, but most historians have surmised we may never truly know who he was. That doesn't mean we can't make our best assumptions from the evidence that's viable and known to be true. Now pour yourself a cup of coffee, curl up on the couch, and settle in as we take a deep dive into one of the most interesting true crime cases to exist. Jack the Ripper began his short-lived reign of terror in Whitechapel, London in 1888. Now when I say short-lived, I mean that all five of his confirmed murders took place within the same year between August and November. And when we talk about Whitechapel and the Whitechapel Five, I just want you all to know that we don't exactly know how many people Jack the Ripper may have actually killed. We have a strong belief that the five are his victims, but this is only speculated. The knowledge of the five wasn't really confirmed by authorities until 1894, so we don't truly know how much legitimacy is behind it. That being said, let us get into the actual murders, and after that we can break it down and look at all the possibilities. Now, before we get into the canonical five, I want to start with a death that is very important and sequential to the idea of the Whitechapel murders. So this death was probably not that of Jack the Ripper's, but it's detrimental to his story because it sets it up. Emma Elizabeth Smith was getting ready for a night out on the 2nd of April, 1888. She was an older and widow woman, a woman who, may, who many referred to as an unfortunate for her lower class status and job as a prostitute. At this time of history in London, um, a lot of lower class women and widowed women, and sp- specifically widowed women who had no man or money, had to resort to this type of lifestyle just to survive. Just like nowadays, prostitution back then was a dangerous business, probably even more so than in our time. Women would often get roughed up by their johns coming home with bruises and black eyes, but Emma needed money to survive, so she worked through the beatings. She had no idea that night she went out would be her last. The next morning at around 1 a.m., so still nighttime, that of the 3rd of April, a fellow housemate, Margaret Hayes, saw Emma conversing with a man from across the way as she was headed back to the boarding house after a rough night of work. Since she had been beaten that night by two men whom she had confirmed were not the man, neither of them were the man who was speaking with Emma, she did not want to get involved with whatever was going on. She would later describe the man to be wearing dark clothing and a white neck scarf. Later that night, Emma arrived back at the boarding house and she was severely beaten and cut. She told another woman at the house that she had been mugged. Her lower part was also injured, so she was convinced by Mary, the other woman, to go see a doctor. The doctor was appalled at how injured she was, not only external injuries, but internal as well. She stuck to her story that a group of men had attacked and mugged her. And Emma's injuries were severe, so she died of her injuries the following morning. The police began a file after that, entitled The Whitechapel Murder. This file would soon hold the cases of five women, the canonical five of Jack the Ripper. Now I'd like to get the canonical five victims, I'd like to get to them, but first I want to mention one more murder that could have possibly been Jack the Ripper. A woman named Martha Tambrum was found brutally murdered and mutilated in George Yard. We have no idea if she was a, if she was attacked by Jack the Ripper or if she was Jack the Ripper's first victim or not, but it's completely possible that she could have been like the victim that led up to him doing his acts that he did. One thing we should realize about these cases of the Rippers is that anything is possible. And Martha Tambrum was slashed in the throat, so there is a connection between her and uh, his victims. So it's a, it's a very possible that she could have been his first victim. 
now we'll start with the first canonical victim of the canonical five. The first one who we know was Jack the Ripper's kill was a woman named Mary Nichols. It was around 3 a.m. on August 31st of 1888 that a man named Charles Cross would find the body of Nichols in a narrow passageway. He was on his way to work and saw a tarp-like piece of fabric. He surmised that it might be useful for his job in the carpentry business, so he went to claim it for himself. Obviously, at this point in time of history, people were just taking things off the street. If someone left something there, you'd just be like, oh, they don't want that anymore. I guess I'll just take it for myself. He had no idea he would find the prone form of an unmoving woman underneath it. Her body was lying face down, her skirts hitched up above her waist. Cross thought she might have been drunk. He called out to his workmate, Robert Paul, who came over to take a look. They checked her for breathing and thought she might be dead, but Paul said he felt movement. The two men in the end decided that they did not want to get further involved in the situation. They decided they're already late for work, they really can't stay and help her sit up or anything like that. So they decided that they would just tell the first policeman or in personnel that they saw what they had found. So they continued on to work. They covered up her lower half, so to cover up her decency, and walked away. If they would have just tried to lift her up, they would have realized that her throat was slashed so deep that her head had almost come off her neck. A constable was the one to make the discovery of her slashed throat as he walked down the narrow passageway. He called for a doctor. A medic, whom the two men from before had notified of the woman, arrived at the scene. The constable set him for reinforcements. The doctor who arrived, Dr. Llewellyn. Dr. Llewellyn saw the extent of the gash on Mary's throat and pronounced her life extinct, so pronounced her dead. Upon further examination of the body, he surmised that the woman could not have been dead for more than an a half an hour. He told the constable this much, and they figured the killer must still be in the area. Three men working in the area, Harry Tompkins, James Mumford, and Charles Britton, were suspected, but later then set free after questioning. They even asked the night watchman of the area, who said they had been awake and alert during the estimated time of her death, and he had not heard or seen anything out of the ordinary. He did, however, mention that around 5 a.m., after her body had been discovered, and before the police had spoken to him, a young man had told him in passing that someone had been murdered up the street. Llewellyn, annoyed with the growing onlookers after news of the murder had spread easily, requested that they move the body to the morgue. They lifted her body onto the wagon to wheel her to be examined in a more discreet location. As they placed her on the cart, the doctor noticed the back of her clothing was soaked with blood, and the blood under her from where she was laying was, was congealed. This means it's clotted. From the observance of the blood, they figured that the woman may have been killed in another place and just merely dumped there. They also came to this conclusion because no one had heard anything out of the ordinary, and if this woman were to have been murdered, there, someone would have heard her screams. The area was residential, after all, with a part of it being a quote-unquote respectable class of people. So probably people who are good doers who would actually speak up if something bad was to happen. But this theory was put to rest when later the coroner informed the police that she must have been murdered in that spot because of the blood that was there and it suggested that her throat was slashed when she was in that downward facing position. Her abdominal injuries that she received were also given to her in that position. But we haven't gotten to those injuries yet. After they had taken her body away and then before the inspector Spratling even arrived, they were already cleaning up the crime scene. When I read this for the first time, I was shocked. But then I remembered that this is just how they did things back then in 1888. They didn't have forensics. They didn't understand blood splatter patterns. They didn't know to look for specific clues like maybe, oh, there could be footprints in blood. You don't know. No, they don't do these things back then. They're not... They're not the most competent of police, and you will see this as we get really into these cases. You will see how incompetent they are.
Spratling made his way to the morgue since there was no crime scene for him to look at anymore. He went to take a description of the deceased, and he was the one to notice under her bloodstained clothing, so her clothing was completely soaked in blood on um, her, her abdomen's side, so you can't really see anything on her body until you get up for a closer look, and he noticed that she had been disemboweled. We would later surmise that this was part of the Ripper's M.O., uh, modus operandi, for those of you who don't watch Criminal Minds. Um, this just means um, something that the killer does most, if not all, the time. It's part of their ritual or how they kill. Once Spratling took note of this, he went to fetch the doctor to do a more thorough examination of the body. But before he could even do this, two senile workhouse people removed the clothes of the woman and began to hose the body down. <laughs> Okay, stop right there. Seriously, the crime scene, I can understand, like, sort of, I guess, but this, this is just ridiculous. The coroner's office was angered that the police would let this happen, but they stated that they gave explicit instructions not to let the body be disturbed until it had been examined. I just, I can't even with this part, guys. I can't even. How could they be so stupid and uncaring about the jobs back then? <sighs> okay. Putting all this aside, the police had to get the body of the woman identified. The police canvassed the area, and many women said that um, she was a woman named Polly who frequented the area, who probably worked in the area, quote-unquote. Uh, while the incompetent and, you know, let's be honest, very stupid police... Honest, and honestly, that's what they are all throughout most of this case, so strap yourselves in for that and be prepared. Spratling is our guy for this. He's the only guy who's even really on it at all, if you want to consider him on it. Spratling noticed the mark of a workhouse on the woman, the Lambeth workhouse, the Lambeth workhouse, on her body. He rightfully, and smartly so, requested that a woman who worked there come and identify the body, and that was when they found her name to be Mary Nichols. Mary, or Polly, as her nickname was, so that's why all the women who identified her to the police told her told them her name was Polly um she was a 43 year old prostitute she had begun the morning of her death drinking at a pub where she was seen at 12 30 a.m so this is all like still nighttime guys it's not p.m it's 12 30 a.m i sometimes i have a differentiation issue with those two things especially when it's like um 12 30 or like 12 o'clock i have a an issue differentiating, so I just want to point this out. This is all taking place at night. She was drunk and she tried to get lodging in the area, but was turned away because she didn't have enough coin. So she set out to sell herself to get the money. The last person to see her alive was her friend Emily Holland at 2.30 a.m. at a grocery store. She saw how drunk Mary was and tried to convince her to come back to the lodging with her. But Nichols refused because she didn't have the money and went off swaying drunkly into the night to find a John to make some cash. No one would hear Mary Nichols die. And there was so many people awake and so very close to the spot that she was killed. There was literally a woman awake in her home pacing her bedroom in the middle of the night because she couldn't sleep. Her window facing that area, that passageway where Mary Nichols' body was found... It's truly baffling to read that no one heard her die when there were so many possible witnesses. There was a constable standing some 50 yards away. I'm just baffled. <laughs> there was also the question of how the killer even escaped and why no one noticed a man covered in blood just walking through the streets of Whitechapel. It was noted that since the blood was probably primarily on his hands because her body was facing toward the ground when he did these things to her and it wasn't facing upwards so no blood splatter would be coming onto his body. So th that the many local slaughterhouses that were in the area would give him an easy excuse to any questioning person that may be like, hey, why are you covered in blood? <laughs> So, desperate for someone to blame, the police turned to place blame on the local gangs of the area, but they were so wrong. <laughs> like I said, my dear listeners, the police in this case are not the best or the brightest at their jobs. I just... Uh, look, I just can't even... 
Every time I reread anything about this case, I remember how awful the police handled this whole investigation, all of the Whitechapel murders. I wonder that if maybe they had handled it differently, they could have possibly caught the guy. But, mm. The inspector, which was, I would assume, is the equivalent of a detective back then. He was the only guy who knew knew what the F he was doing. I just, mm, I can't even. So, the police, of course, had no idea that they were wrong about this assumption of gangs. They had no idea this was not going to be the last gruesome slaying in Whitechapel. <laughs> Thank you all for sticking with me through this long episode. We have a lot to cover in this case. That's why each victim of the Canonical Five will be getting their own episode on the podcast. I don't want to miss any important details of the case. I'll try to post each episode for this case every other day if time and personal life permits. Uh, keep yourselves updated by checking out my Twitter. Just look up Coffee and Crime Podcast on Twitter and you'll find me. I hope to see you all here for the next episode as we dive deep into my favorite case to read about. Until next time.